Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and very welcome to Oxford Books today. It's a great pleasure to see a lot of very familiar faces, but equally also a number of new faces. For those of you who don't know me yet, lucky you, my name is Björn Asmussen. I'm a senior lecturer in marketing here at Oxford Brookes University, and we have also uh, a few students, a few sufferers uh, amongst uh, the group here. I'm also, uh, for my sins, the, the co-lead of the Brand Strategy Research Group, and I have the great pleasure for almost four years to, to conduct research together with the BCMA and uh, Ipsos Mori, and this is one of the reasons why I'm here today to have the pleasure to host the event. The event today is part of the Inside series, the, the branded uh, Content Marketing Association's Inside series. And the great thing today is we're all allowed to use the F word in public. <laughs> effectiveness. Yeah? So we're all allowed to talk about effectiveness uh, today, which is, of course, a, a quite dynamic, quite a challenging uh, topic. And I'm pleased to say that I'm not giving uh, the main presentations today. We have two uh, very experienced senior people uh, from uh, marketing communications, uh, one area, market research, and of course, then from the Branded Content Marketing Association, we have uh, Andrew Kunter. Uh, important to say is this event today is part of a larger context. It is part of the F week the Effectiveness Week, uh, which is organized by the IPA, the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising. And if you get the hang of it today, you have the chance to go to over another 50 events over the next four or five days. Yeah, <laughs> quite a few events take place uh, in London, and uh, the BCMA, together with the IPA, organized this uh, event today as a satellite uh, event. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Andrew Kanter, the global CEO of the Branded Content Marketing Association, and quite a few of you know Andrew already, and Andrew will paint the bigger picture for us today, why measuring branded content, effectiveness, and return on investment is so important, but unfortunately also so challenging, or fortunately. And then we hand over to Eleanor thornton Firkin. Uh, she joined us uh, from the Ipsos uh, Connect team that looks particularly at content development but also creativity. And she will then try to give some concrete examples of the strengths and weaknesses and challenges and opportunities when it comes to the F word, effectiveness, measuring uh, return on investment. After that, uh, we have an open question and discussion and those of you who have joined our previous events particularly here in the Brooks restaurant, we have usually a quite heated debate. We will keep it probably to about 10, 15 minutes today so that we then later on have uh, a few more minutes for my final words and then probably about <coughs> 20 minutes for a bit of networking and then we can continue uh, the discussions and the heated uh, debates in, in a smaller circle. Talking about heated, in the unlikely event of any emergency, yeah, there's an emergency exit round the corner through the glass door and the emergency congregation, uh, congregation point is in front of the bus stop. Just if, you know, hopefully the discussion will not get that heated. Yeah, <laughs> so we should all be fine, just in, in the case of an emergency. So uh, I managed to talk, I think, just five minutes, which is a new record for a short introduction. Please give a very warm welcome to <coughs> Andrew Kanter. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Bjorn. Wow. Um, I, I chose that title because we're in an academic environment. I thought it was quite, you know, something to have quite wordy. But uh, for those that you don't know about Branded Content Marketing Association, we are the global uh, member organization for brands uh, using content as part of their marketing activities. So we work with lots of different agencies and brands and platforms, and I'm delighted to see our friends from Ocean Outdoor are, are here, one of our... Uh, newest members, um, because there's so many amazing things that you can do, particularly in uh, the outdoor environment as well. As I say, we're global, so we have lots of different uh, partnerships around the world and chapters. In fact, we've just recently appointed a, a new president in the US, and I'm pleased to say it's not Trump or Clinton. It's actually Sam Zizes from uh, Learned Media. 
We're looking to grow uh, into India uh, and China and also we're having discussions now where we're launching into Italy uh, in January. France is coming online hopefully uh, at the end of this year and we're having discussions in Germany and South Korea. So we're growing uh, the network and that's because more people are doing great content. We're all about best practice. That's really what we're here to do. We're about best practice and shared learning. And we really want to share that with you today. But I think, you know, what comes with best practice is understanding what is happening when you're doing content. And effectiveness is a key to that. Is it as bloody as that? Yeah, uh, it, it, it really has been a crusade of mine. Uh, I came into the organization about 12 years ago. And I came from a media background, so everything that I did was very analytical and was driven by data, and it was audited. Um, and I came into this wonderful world of branded content, and there really wasn't anything to show how effective it was. And I just thought, well, how can we ask our clients to, to invest all that money into something that isn't being measured? So I was really brought in to, to kind of develop that area. And that journey really took me, it was very interesting and um, when you start thinking about branded content and measurement and uh, actually I put it into Google measuring branded, I got three, about over three million results but actually it's more about focusing on the actual term and I'm actually pleased to say that BCMA does come up quite well in terms of uh, the top uh, sites but all right that aside um, we, we did spend a long time developing uh, a process to uh, if, uh, you know, measure the effectiveness of branded content. And that was really going out and talking to the, the companies that were measuring uh, effectiveness <coughs> across advertising. So we talked to Millwood Brown, TNS, um, and of course Ipsos Mori. Oh, sorry, I've gone too far there. I always like this quote because, you know, I think in, in the world of content, you've got to experiment. And I think people are, qu are quite afraid. I think what has happened, in, certainly in the world of social media, is brands have lost control. And with that, you know, losing control is not a good thing. But I think there's not enough brands doing enough testing and trying and failing, because actually we learn more from stuff that doesn't work than does. And I think you can't do everything on your own. So from an organisational perspective, we work in partnership with lots of organisations. And particularly in research and measurement, collaboration for us is, is really key because there are lots of people doing some really interesting work in this area. And about five or six years ago, we, uh, we developed and we launched Content Monitor, uh, which I can talk to you about in a bit more detail now. Just before we get there, um, when I think about the way that the world is developing now, we've got a lot of data now. Every client every agency, every organization really is inundated with data. And I think the, some of the issues really is that it's about what you do with it. It's about interpretation of that data. And I think that what YouTube and Facebook and to a certain extent Twitter has done is it's made us a little bit lazy because we say, well, you know, it's done 10 million views on YouTube. So it must be all right. Or we've got lots of followers or, we, or people have liked it. But, you know, to me it's like, well, you, what's your branded content doing for your brand? How is it changing behavior? I know ultimately we need to sell more products and services, but you need to evaluate it, you need to understand it. Because when you look at the way that we measure media, we have a lot of gold standards there. For, for TV, we've got Barb, for radio, Rajar, you can see there, for newspapers, for, for pretty much everything. So why not for branded content? Well, I think we do, and I think, you know, our solution was to come up with something that was universally accepted for the industry. So for Content Monitor, it really was about answering three questions. It was, you know, how is the campaign performing? You know, what is the ROI in terms of each of the key brand metrics? And because a lot of campaigns now have lots of different channels, it was looking at each individual channel and looking at how each one worked in isolation and each one worked together. And then we thought, well, you know, we've got to look to the future and, and how about uh, looking at how we can optimise and learn. And the good thing about it was it was a very modular approach. So in the beginning, we took it out to the IPA and ISBAR and Thinkbox. 
to get their buy-in for it. Uh, we've looked at uh, some studies for lots of big brands, big agencies, and big media organizations. And we have some good case studies. Um, but, you know, being honest, we don't have enough. So, you know, and this is something I wanted to show you because obviously working with the IPA, you know, as a partner, and this is Lynn Robinson, the research director, and she was very uh, supportive of it, which is great. Again, you know, this is something that we were very uh, keen to do and take it to the industry. Because we know what success looks like. And that to us is the brands that have been leading this charge um, understood that they needed to evaluate what they were doing. I'm really just looking at some of the highlights and headlines and obviously we can uh, go into it in a lot more detail. But, you know, there's some big brands there and they really wanted to understand what branded content was doing. Again, just a snapshot of some of the uh, work that we, we were doing for HSBC. This was a campaign that was targeting high net worth individuals with over a million pounds worth of liquid asset. I don't know many people like that, you, you may well do, but uh, you know, this is why we have to work with the experts like Ipsos who can find these people. Um, but it just showed us the depth of, of information and knowledge that you can get. And when we took this to HSBC, the, I'll be honest, the, uh, the head of uh, insight and planning was, was quite sceptical and he said, well, you know, we spend millions and millions of pounds on research. You know, what, what is Content Monitor going to show us? But actually, at the end of the day, he, you know, he, he said, look, what you've given us is real insight into what our audience are like, how it makes them feel towards our brands. And we talk a lot about emotion now. And I think content is one of those areas that really does you know, look at the emotional uh, response. So we were quite pleased with that. This was from another study we did with uh, Toyota, and it was showing the value of each an individual element. Because we measured everything individually, we could show how the promotion of the show uh, worked uh, again, you know, in, you know, together with each element of the campaign. And this was another quote we got when we worked with ITV for the Morrison's campaign. And you know, this was all about looking at the methodology because obviously we've got to have it stand up to the rigor of, of, of how people want to measure stuff. And I think it's right that you know we were, you know, working with one of the biggest platforms of ITV. You know, and they were saying, you know, it's actually shown us how our promotions are working, uh, uh, you know, in conjunction with those uh, branded content as well. So there's a lot of good learning, I would say, that, that's come out of Content Monitor. But I don't think it's enough. And I, and I really uh, looked at Effectiveness Week and we were really keen to, to work uh, together with the IPA because we really felt there was a need to, I would say, you know, reinvigorate what we've been doing with Content Monitor for the last few years. And I really do believe it's a call to action for the industry because <clears throat> there's more and more examples of content. And I do, you know, I'm very privileged to be able to judge a lot of the award ceremonies and the, you know, w that we now have for, for branded content and content marketing. And again, you know, there isn't really any universal measurement. <coughs> Everyone's doing it in a slightly different way and it's very difficult to judge you know, and to make comparisons. So you know, I really do believe we, we need to work together. We need support from the industry and that's from all areas of the industry. And I think it is the right time to do it. I've been very lucky to work with some very interesting and influential people in the 25 years or so I've been working in marketing and advertising and we work with uh, Virgin Media Business and we uh, help them to do their Pitch to Rich campaign for the last couple of years and uh, you know Richard Branson has a, a saying and that this was his book you know he's like well screw it let's do it you know and I just think that's such a great way of putting it into words and I think that is what we need to do uh, and that is why I'm delighted to say that today we are officially launching Content Monitor 2.0 uh, because it's the right time and I believe the industry needs it and you know I want to have your support in pushing this out universally and for people to accept it so I'll stop there and uh, I will now hand over to Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I'm going to look at how we can start to unpick and understand whether content can deliver ROI. So I'll 
after all. That's what we're here for. Talk about effectiveness. So I'm going to talk about some general principles. Then I'm going to talk about the framework for evaluation in uh, Content Monitor 2.0. And then I'm going to show some examples. And this is based on some R&D that we did last year that helps to understand how we might go about helping our clients decide whether actually they can prove ROI to their broader business. So first of all, some principles. I'm sure everybody who is involved in content uh, will have been following the debate about is it content, is it advertising, does content work, blah, blah, blah. It's every day. In any newsletter that you read, there's always some stuff about this. All right, Mr. Pritchard from Procter & Gamble, he's very adamant that there is no such thing as content. It's all advertising. Because he hasn't read our research report. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we can send him a gold-plated one. <laughs> um, but what we wanted to understand is, actually, what do consumers think this stuff is? So last year, um, in a qualitative phase of, of our R&D, we showed people a lot of branded content and then tried to get them to talk about it over a week. So I'm just going to play you something that I think is a brilliant piece of branded content and then we'll see a consumer reaction to it. you haven't seen it, that's Lexus Hoverboard. The only bit branding in there at the beginning is it says brought to you from Lexus at the beginning and then at some point does an amazing jump over a whole Lexus <coughs> drive through. That's it. Barely anything in there but an amazing show of the new and cool technology and innovation that they want to be known for. But when we asked people what they think that was, they seem to agree with Mr. Pritchard. The words that they use to describe that are <coughs> advert, advertising, uh, comms, but advert and advertising predominantly. So when we're talking to consumers about showing them what this stuff is, they're still using the language of advertising. That's just important to know when we're designing our questionnaires. But there are differences, and there are differences from the consumer side. I'm not talking about uh, the report, which is very much from our side. From the managerial uh, perspective, absolutely. Yeah. This is from consumer side, right? So, uh, ooh, people pay good money to see great content, like Star Wars. But what they, why they go is because they think it's going to be fun. They think it's going to be exciting. There's something in it for them. Advertising, on the other hand, does not need to be likable. It helps but absolutely doesn't need to be, can be as blimmin' annoying as Mr. Gio Campario, who works so well they had to bring him back, but by no means somebody that you'd like to make an appointment to spend dinner with, <laughs> or even uh, interrupt your programming. But of course, branded content needs to do a bit of both. It needs to do the engagement, the drawing people in of Star Wars, that deliver, needs to deliver a brand benefit like <coughs> Gio Campario. And it's got to do that in a, in a balanced way and draw people in. So it's a pretty difficult task. I don't think anybody in the room thinks that branded content is easy, uh, but we need to see <coughs> how we can make sure it gets even better. And last week at the ANA the, uh, in America, uh, Mr. Pritchard again said, too often we produce crap. Craft or crap, that's our creative challenge. And technology enables both. And of course, a lot of what we do in branded content, not all of it by any means, but a lot of what we do is online. And because the technology is there and it's relatively cheap to produce, brands are sticking all sorts of stuff out there. 
without really thinking about how it fits into their marketing strategy, how it fits into people's current perceptions of brands, and really if it's any good or not. And that's partly why we need to get uh, a content monitor 2.0 out there, so we can all make better content. And what might good content look like? Well, of course, you've got people. And ultimately, it is all about how people receive and engage with it. But what should it be like? So the content itself needs to be something that can draw people in, that can be emotionally involving, or can be entertaining, useful, good to pass on, make you feel better about you know, sharing stuff with your friends. But it needs to be engaging and suck you in. It does, in some way, also need to be, co be um, congruent with the current brand perceptions. It can certainly start to change them, edge them out, you know, make them a little bit more risque because of the um, environment in which they're delivering them. But ultimately, if you wander too far from where your brand started, people just go, what's this? I, I don't understand it. It doesn't feel right for me. So think about how you can make it work for the brand. And then the platform. How and where you're delivering it makes a great difference to people's expectations because A, they feel and behave differently on different platforms. And also they have certain expectations of that platform. And you need to not disrupt the vibe of why they're there. Certainly disrupt them creatively, but think about the platform. Think about the mechanism that you're using. And ideally, of course, try and push that technology to its furthest extent as well. The reason why we need to think about people, and this is me, um, is that actually branded content, unlike advertising, really has to compete exceptionally hard with your own reality. So all this stuff that might be in my head, that you know, is distracting me at home, um, this is all much more important to me than any messages that brands are trying to feed to me. No matter how good, yeah, well wrapped they are, you know, I'd much rather understand how to defeat level 325 of Candy Crush. And we shouldn't kid ourselves that we're important out there. And nor should we kid ourselves that there's a whole set of consumers wandering around the internet trying to find the best bits of branded content. It's not a safari. Really, it's this tiny little microcosm. Most people have about five websites to five apps within their sort of general life where they go habitually. They go there most days, they spend a reasonable amount of time there, but they don't really stray outside that goldfish bowl very often. So we need to really think about that. How are we going to get into people's lives if actually people's lives are really quite tiny? So eyeballs really need to be planned. No matter how great your content is, if you don't think about how you get it in front of people, they're simply not going to see it. And nor can you rely on one or two key people passing it on and then the whole world finds it, because that doesn't happen either. Uh, this is a number from our Global Trends study from two years ago now, but with no reason to believe this has gone up exponentially. 6% of people say they've shared something online. Something. Not even branded content, just something. You know, people are not out there doing your work for you. <coughs> so I would spend a lot of time on this. How am I going to get it in front of people? Do I need to pay for it? The answer is increasingly yes. How can I do that most efficiently? This bit is outside my remit of today, but uh, if you want to talk about how to do that, then um, come and talk to me later. <coughs> so, let's think about a framework for success. There are a couple of elements to the research that we do. Number one is a quant piece. It's always test versus control. So a control is where we ask brand metrics just by exposing people to a logo, and in the test, we show them some branded content and then ask uh, some questions about that content, 
but then also the brand stuff as well. And we're looking for an uplift between no exposure and exposure. I said earlier on that platform and how it's delivered is really important. So we have to show it in the context of where people are expecting to find it, or rather where you've planned for them to find it. Now, it doesn't need to be a totally live environment, but it needs to replicate and have the context there. And of course, it should be done against the people that you're trying to influence. You can do it on a wider audience, but branded content is really only going to be seen by a, a narrow uh, group of people anyway. So let's concentrate on the target. Beyond that, you can also add on some qualitative research if you need to get deeper into what's happening and what people might want to talk about. An online community here works best. Uh, if we're talking about online content. You can include some influencers, some people who are sort of more in that 6% of sharers, if you like. Um, and again, here, it's to try and understand how this might fit into people's real worlds. We might want to try and aim off a little bit for the reality um, within the quant. So we can add this on and layer it on. And we use a consistent KPI framework. Now, just because we have many measures doesn't mean that they're all important. So we need to understand for each piece of branded content, and that could be each individual element of a campaign or the campaign as a whole, what is it trying to achieve and measure it only <coughs> against those objectives and against any objective that you care to think of or that uh, somebody down the hall has decided is important. What is it designed to do? So here's a little grid, because it is a research presentation, you have to have one. Um, across the top we have attention, so getting eyeballs on it. Engagement, how are people interacting with it, how is it making them feel. And impact, what is it going to do for the brand? This first box, viewing or exposure to hook and content, and by hook I mean you know, the one or two little lines that might pull you in, or the the icon or the image that might draw your eye. All the content itself, these bits out there in the real world can all be measured through behavioural metrics and ought to be. In Content Monitor uh, number one, we used to have an attention measure where we asked people whether they had seen it, whether they would see it. But really there are so many ways now and so few people who actually see it that that felt like a redundant measure when you can do it more accurately yeah. through actual metrics. But the other KPIs are survey-based. I've split them into content and brand because you can love a piece of content and it can have bugger all to do with that brand and indeed absolutely no impact whatsoever. So we've separated the two elements. Uh, the KPI for engagement is engagement. That can be measured either through likability or we can layer on neuro techniques like facial coding to really understand how people are, are reacting in the moment <coughs> to that kind of stuff. And then the impact of the content is more around activation, amplification, or revisiting. Does it make you want to repost it on Facebook or does it make you want to go back to that feed Paddy Power is actually included in uh, the R&D that we did, and they have such a loyal following of people who aren't really using it to understand betting. It's instead rather a comedy stream, <coughs> and they use it such, but you know, they go back and again and again and again. So good for them. Uh, with the brand, it's all about, have you even realized that it came from a brand? What brand was it for? How well linked is it? Does it feel right for the brand? And we'll see in a little bit that if it doesn't feel right for the brand, it can really veer you off course. And the ultimate ROI metrics. Is it going to increase your purchase consideration? Is it going to change your associative networks, uh, those brand attributes that have sat in your brain for a long time? Is it going to change them for the better in the way that you want them to? Or advocacy, are they going to recommend you? So. KPI framework, all wrapped up in a very simple little questionnaire framework. Uh, it really is incredibly simple and short, so you show the idea, the content. 
You can add facial coding if you want to at that stage, although we would prefer to put skipping in there. So the first time that people see it, we encourage them to just watch as much as they like. Uh, and then we'll replay it again if we want to add facial coding on the top. Some likability around engagement, content diagnostics, so how they, what are their spontaneous reactions? What are they taking out of it? What hooks them in? What are the key visuals that they really like? Brand, link, brand impact uh, as appropriate for the objective. And it's this side, the brand bits, that get us tests and control. So you can look at the uplift in those two areas. So I think I might just ask if that's clear to people before we go on to examples. Broadly makes sense? Yeah? OK. You could ask me more difficult questions at the Q&A. So uh, examples. Well, here's our content platform brand. Of course, the people are the ones that are responding. And here are the bits of content that we tested. Yes, their position on the map uh, does reveal what they may have done well or not done well. I'm not going to talk about always Paddy Power and GoPro today, but again, in the Q&A or afterwards, if you want to ask me about those, please do so. And the reason why I'm not is because they're just overwhelmingly good at it, and I want to show you some cases where you might have learned something about what to do about the ROI uh, if we had been doing a real test. So. Lexus. We saw that great bit of branded content earlier. How did it play out in the real world? Well, Lexus is a little bit dull. You know, it's not the kind of car that your average 25-year-old goes, bloody hell, I wish my dad would buy me a Lexus. You know, they probably want a BMW or a Mercedes or, or something like that. This Lexus thing, what is it? I don't know. It's got no sort of personality. And so we talked to people who could have the potential in the future, the sufficient income in the future, to buy one. And we did test first control, showed them the uh, hoverboard stuff. 70% of them liked it. Brilliant. And half of them said it's not what they expect from the brand. So we're starting to change people's perceptions of what it might be that this brand's all about. Which means that, in effect, we're emotionally priming them for the future. When potentially they might have enough money to buy one of these things, are they going to feel better about it? So from test control, see a 12% point uh, uplift in for people like me and up 9% on a brand I aspire to. So it's just starting to set the scene that actually maybe Lexus isn't this dull, boring, conservative brand. Maybe actually it is something that I might want to get, that I might aspire to, that I might even save up my hard-earned money, <coughs> buy one of those, never mind the house, car would be much more fun. And Cyber Lions are the outcome. McDonald's also has some sort of um, issue with its 18 to 25 year olds as well. They, they go a lot <coughs> to McDonald's, <coughs> but do they really like it? Do they really feel it's relevant to them? Are they going to remember to go there after they've got more than a pound in their pocket? How can they make McDonald's more relevant for today? Now, I know what you're probably thinking. What is Channel Up? Over the next 15 weeks, we're asking you to put your skills and talents to the test. Every week, we have just 72 hours to complete a challenge. That's right, 72 hours. And you are going to help us do it. So, in this case, they're using vloggers to help them. You may know, have, have no idea what they're actually going to do from that clip. That was pretty much how everybody felt. Um, actually, every 72 hours, they're going to learn a new skill, they're going to become a circus or a uh, performer, or they're going to learn how to DJ, or they're going to do something like this. And these two guys are going to follow them through it and you know, really get on board with them and communicate and all this kind of stuff. It's going to be brilliant. What it has to do with McDonald's, 
Let me really nice. Um, and the YouTube channel itself has virtually no branding on it. This small yellow logo here, can you see that at the back? <coughs> yes? You have amazing eyesight. <coughs> um, Deeny tiny, and not a mention of McDonald's in any of the actual content videos. So the consequence of subtle uh, badging is actually subtle branding. 18% of people, bearing in mind they've just seen it, had no idea, oh sorry, knew that it was for McDonald's. 21% branded it Channel Us, the name of the YouTube channel. 61% absolutely not a clue or said it was for something else, some other random sort of youth brand. But the overwhelming majority of those people, not a clue. Which really is a problem. It's good to go for a softly, softly approach, but you do need to have at least some link to the brand in order to get any benefit. Because the attributes that they wanted to move did not move at all. A great deal of personal meaning to me or uh, is for people like me. No shift. Didn't change people's relationship with the brand. They'll still go because all 18 to 24 year olds go to McDonald's. So how many uh, videos were the people exposed? So they watch the overall, so there's a sort of a, a video that introduces the whole concept and in, yeah, tells them about each of the individual bits that they might see underneath. So they saw that one. So just one, one yeah. video, okay. Yeah. yeah, and actually for all of these things, they're only seeing one of the videos. Uh, if we were doing it for real, we might show them the whole campaign. They might get more of an idea um, and you might see something different, <coughs> although I very much suspect not in this case. Because the people who they are targeting are the followers of the vloggers, and the vloggers would probably get, uh, or the followers would get much more involved and, and then see uh, a huge uh, number of these videos and then maybe pick it up. Yes, now that would have been lovely had that happened. Okay. And that clearly was the intention, but um, unfortunately it wasn't the reality. So the thing is that even with the vloggers' fame, if the end point of where you push them to is not sufficiently um, useful or entertaining, then there's no repeat purchase, no but repeat view. But you only measured it after one video, so you didn't measure it uh, looking at the people who actually followed the, the whole series of videos? No, but if you look on YouTube, you can see that there are about a couple of thousand subscribers max. So there really aren't any people okay. who are doing that. So, <laughs> so what these guys uh, are saying about it is that it was still a great opportunity for them to learn, to understand what they might be able to do. And really, I think what McDonald's did well here was to say, do you know what, enough is enough. It's not working for us. We need to go back. We need to think about this again and see what we could do better, differently, how we might engage and motivate more strongly. But they had a go. They had a go, they learned something, they can move on and they can do something different. I think that's really what this is about. Making sure that we're learning from our experiences so we can take it forwards. And then the final example is Felix. Um, you can imagine how this went. We are a cat food brand. We have a lovable cat. Where can we see lots of lovable cats? YouTube, the home of lovable cats. In 2005, cat videos found a new home. It was called YouTube. 36 million videos later, cat videos became the currency of the internet. Welcome to Felix Cat Gag, the world's premier made up stock market for the hottest trending cat videos. Thing is, Felix is a quiet, cheeky little chap. This is a bit of Larry in your face uh, cat tack action. Also, nobody knows what CatDAC is. Um, or indeed, NASDAQ. So, not really sure where they were going with that. But uh, already starts to feel a little bit tricky for the brand. And also, if you're going to say, here are all the world's greatest cat videos, do you actually need to show them some cat videos? And more on that in a second. Uh, Aaron Kraskell was the front man for that. He's a Vine star, 
although who knows what he's doing these days. Um, and then there was this, this lady who apparently was on telly in the middle of the night, but nobody knows who she is. Her name's Jane. And uh, you can see quite clearly from the videos that there is a big difference in Aaron versus middle of the night lady. Okay. He's got 112,000 views, she's got 2,700. Uh, and that's sort of, on average, the difference we're seeing between them. So, you know, a famous face can pull people in, and it can pull people in differently uh, on different campaigns. But, as I said, if you're promising them cat videos, probably need to have a different balance between cats and Aaron. More cats, less vlogger. Would have been the right way to go. Set people up to see something lovely and funny, get a Vine star. And the thing is, it's also not that Felix. And so we get, it's not the type of thing I'd expect from Felix, and I don't like it. 56%. And these are cat owners, by the way. So, you know, it would be better. <laughs> It would be better if they did like them. And this is a lady saying it better than I can. I think the brand was shown well because it was so bold. Um, but to be honest, it just makes me feel like the bad brand is trying to patronise me. Um, and I don't feel like it fits with the, con the brand. I uh, feel like always has really funny adverts with the animated cat and I really enjoyed them. But then this is a bit iffy for me and I don't really think the brand had much of an impact to the video. It just kind of, for me, it makes the brand's image worse because I did not like the content. So you can use the quoll to help you sort of understand a little bit more and bring it to life. Um, but basically, it didn't fit with her expectations of what the brand ought to be talking about, the tone of voice it should take which unfortunately led to a consequence that no brand wants to see. This is a five-point uh, five purchase intention scale, and the bottom point is would not buy. You do not want to see an uplift, an uplift or a downshift, whichever way you, you <laughs> like to look at it, a significant movement in would not buy your brand. This is not a good outcome. Doesn't happen very often, but it can go horribly wrong. So just be think, think about that if you're trying to do an experiment. And consequently, the last video posted was 10 months ago, as it dies a quiet death. So those are some of the ways that you might look at in order to optimize uh, the actual content itself. But can we tell the CFO that there is the potential, note, potential, uh, to get ROI? And one of the ways we can do that is to look at the point shift in consideration. So Lexus, which we've already seen, big uplift in consideration. We're really starting to change people's minds with something motivating <coughs> and engaging for that audience. GoPro, which is building its brand through branded content in a marvellous way, up 9%. Then you've got Paddy Power and Always, who are really the repeat uh, users of content. And they're stable. It's taken them the right way. But you know they've already had their biggest uplifts. It's just keeping people fresh. And McDonald's at 4%. It wasn't a bad idea. It's just that they couldn't get the, the core benefit out of it because there wasn't enough McDonald's in it. And Felix actually at the very sort of light consideration level, only going down a little bit. But don't forget that would not buy on purchase intention. So you can tell people that it has the potential. And if you can then find a way to multiply that with the eyeballs that you actually get on your content, then that should help you to really get to a proper ROI number. So in conclusion, plan for success. It ain't going to happen by accident. People aren't stumbling across this stuff. So you have to think about it. Make sure it is part of the overall marketing strategy so it can feel right for the brand, so that you can use all those distinctive assets that you've built up over the years to help you get more eyeballs. Avoid the crap trap. 
stop putting rubbish out there. Uh, think really carefully about why you're doing it, what it's there for, and how you can make it more engaging. And before you spend money on it, before you think about that strategy of getting it out there, make sure that you evaluate its potential for <coughs> ROI. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, Andrew and Eleanor, for these uh, really insightful presentations. I would like to ask both um, to, to join me now here up front and also please give a very warm welcome to Ross Williams, who is a research director at Ipsos Mori, and he has been involved for several years with us in, in the research about branded content. So welcome, Ross. Okay, Molly is going to help us with the microphone. So the first question at the back, Indra Neil. Hi, uh, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. My question is to do more on the methodology side of things. You did explain to us the difference between advertising and branded content. My question is more to do with, is there a difference <coughs> in measuring advertising versus branded content effectiveness? <coughs> Second bit of the same question is, uh, I'll tell you why do I have this question. It's because advertising uses a lot of consumer neuroscience techniques to understand using very similar methodology ad effectiveness. Uh, but they also use uh, methodologies that are a little more, um, say, a little more succinct because they, for example, facial action um, coding system can be quite subjective, whereas things like an EEG or fMRI are a lot more uh, reliable in terms of the data they produce. And also, I didn't really see, uh, you know, subconscious as a factor that was featured in content uh, monitoring. So for me, I'm trying to understand what is the main sort of core competency of your software as compared to something like an emotive, which consumer neuroscientists use. Long question, sorry. Yes, so shall we deal with fMRI and EEG first? Um, versus facial coding, they are different. fMRI, EEG, massively sensitive. Often, ridiculously sensitive. I clench my jaw. I think about the amazing dinner I had last night. I, and all sorts of things happen. Sometimes they are too sensitive <coughs> to measure advertising. There are companies out there who do it successfully, so fair play. Uh, it tends to be non-scalable. Actually, to recruit 35 people is pretty expensive. And so actually looking for a method that is scalable globally, rather than uh, in Oxford, uh, and actually gives you the right sense of accuracy to help you understand diagnostically an emotional story, we feel that facial coding is better for that. Um, it's an argument that will be raging for years to come. So we use facial coding. We could use EEG if you want. Certainly won't be using fMRI because uh, that breaks everybody's bank. Um, anyway, so yeah, you have to pick the right horse of the course. That gets to your emotional uh, unconscious response. You can actually also add in implicit reaction time, which is a way of understanding brand impact as an unconscious response as well. We haven't put it in here at the moment because again, we need to understand about <coughs> value and how much people are willing to pay for their content evaluation, given that it is cheaper in general than advertising. So we include <coughs> it in our advertising testing, but not in content testing. If people want to, it can absolutely go in there. <coughs> then the first bit of your question was advertising testing versus content testing. We use testing control, just as we do with our advertising testing. But advertising, because you're putting it out there, and people really have to see it. Uh, we use a distracted media environment where we have lots of different bits of media and we ask people would they remember seeing something and what brand it was for after we've exposed them to that media environment. Because there is only one way that you're delivering advertising. That is not true of content and hence why we've taken the attention part out of content but not out of advertising. Is that? Yeah. Ross, anything? Oh, to I, I, was, 
I'm not sure I'm on, but can I just check? Um, does everyone know what facial coding is? is no, if you maybe explain that. Yeah. yeah. So just I briefly, yeah. Does, that, does anybody not? Go on, put your hand up if you don't. Okay. Okay. So, so you are in face coding. Uh, there's a monitor here. It's got a webcam on it. I ask you, do you mind if, you, if I turn on the webcam? You say, no, of course, that'll be absolutely fine for you to see me in my pyjamas. And then you watch some advertising. And as you're doing that, we're taking a baseline of what your face is resting places because some of us are happy, some of us not so much. So it needs to understand what your resting face is, and then it's looking for deltas in your uh, facial movements, and then it codes it using an algorithm to the emotion that you're feeling. And that's based on the same stuff that universities have used to do um, by you know, just coding manually rather than with a machine, but we do it at scale. So that's how it works. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, just, just a quick comment. What I <coughs> really liked uh, about uh, Eleanor's presentation is she made a really important point that, and it also refers to your question, we need to, you know, if we are in the industry, we have to be aware that we always need to see what we want to measure from the target audience's perspective, from the consumer perspective. And Eleanor uh, made it really clear. <coughs> we might think advertising and branded content are very different uh, things, concepts. And we've conducted several years' research within the industry to figure out the differences. And it's really important within the industry that we understand the differences and the similarities. But when we do consumer research, we really need to look at the perspective uh, of the consumer. So thank you very much for, for that point. We've got another question. Just <coughs> Yes, uh, Mr. Bonfa, and uh, I'm involved uh, with strategies. And that's why my, my question will be, so how do you see the, let's say, the link between uh, say, strategy development and implementation? Because we are talking about delivery, we are talking about even monitoring at the end, because this should be link each other. Now, if you starting with content, I suppose most of the content is unstructured data. So this means you have to, in a holistic way, try to integrate it first, the content, in a more, let's say, in a more structured, more strategical. So my question is the implementation aspect between the strategy that on the marketing side with implementation, keeping in consideration your target in a real time is simultaneous. So on this one, which kind of platform are you using? Because it looks that you are isolating. If you have the platform, you have the content, you have the, let, let's say the brand. So they are not all integrate each other. That's my question. Therefore the implementation of the strategy, all this type of, uh, uh, let's say, way of doing mm. Okay, so within the content monitor itself, it is of course the piece of content delivered, say through YouTube or on Facebook or whatever, um, with the brand attached. So but by the time we structure, yes, like so by the time we get to the testing, it's already wrapped up. Now, how many brand owners are there here today? Few. Okay, yeah. and do you have a man down the hall that does content and a man down the other end of the hall that does marketing, or do you have one person who's in charge of it? It's one on one team. Yeah. Okay, but different people. So that's a at least good that you're in one team, because at the beginning of all this sort of stuff, uh, many of our clients had a marketing function and the young chap down the hall <laughs> who was doing content because nobody else understood what it was. And so actually, the marketing guy who was doing the strategy, understanding the consumer and all that kind of stuff, didn't talk to the guy over there who just put out any old stuff that he thought would be appropriate and he could do because it was cool. And so now we're seeing that these two things are coming together and most clients are now like you guys. The strategy is decided <coughs> overall and each of those elements then fits into it. And we are strong advocates of that. 
if you try and plan your content outside of your overall marketing strategy, doom, doom lies that way. So that's what we would advise. I'm not sure it's answered your question, but. My question is to do this, which kind of tool are you using? You see, you're talking about content, mm -hmm. even large amount of content. You have to structure, you have to integrate it, you have to, to analyze, and you have to deliver it, and you have to, to say, monitor it. Mm -hmm. So each of the steps, there is a tool there. Okay. How do you link each other in order to reach your objective? I think, I think there are two issues coming yeah. out of uh, this question. And uh, I think one uh, was touched by Andrew earlier, that content and content marketing is still pretty much in its infancy. We might not like it, but it is pretty much still the case. We are trying to start measuring content without having a clear strategic idea how it should be integrated with overall marketing communication <coughs> strategy. And I think this touches some of the issues you have. We, we are looking into how do you do content marketing on a strategic level? But again, within the industry, if you ask here now 20 people, you will get yeah. probably 15 different answers. I think so that's the point. They, there is no consistency. And I think that some brands are doing it really, really well. Some are doing it really, really badly. And there's a whole raft in between. And I think that that's the point is that, you know, and we need to get better at doing it. I yeah. think the and the other issue that comes out of your question and causes us a lot of headache and uh, Eleanor actually touched it in a way I wouldn't necessarily phrase it. She called it the crap trap. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, some colleagues I, I work uh, with here, we would call it you missed the sweet spot. And missing the sweet spot is something that actually has a, a very strategic angle because what Felix and mm. what McDonald's didn't manage to do, to do proper research about their brand yeah. and how they could relate their brand to the target audiences and the target audiences interests. They came up with some skill training, which is quite nice for some brands, but obviously it was nothing that really resonated with the McDonald's brand. So this means the elements is missing there, it's the innovation side. You have to identify something that is new and then you brand it. I think it's not about being new, but it's about something that works also for your brand. If McDonald's had used something that is maybe closer to their business, closer to what people organically associate with the McDonald's brand, and just slightly improving the image, such as, for example, healthy food. Yeah? And McDonald's produces sometimes healthier food than we actually think. If they would have created something around that, it might have been more successful. Um, Eleanor also, no, it was Andrew who used something like lazy metrics. And I think uh, what McDonald's have done and also what Felix have done is they used lazy content. You know, they come up with something that is maybe uh, innovative, but if it doesn't work with the existing brand image, it's a big risk that it actually doesn't work and maybe even pee off your, your existing mm. uh, target audience. So uh, I think it will be difficult to answer you know, all the strategic issues that there are in content marketing at the moment, and particularly bringing content marketing together with all the different other marketing communications disciplines. But, but hopefully uh, the idea of a sweet spot, and maybe we can later on talk about this, an organization needs to find the sweet spot when they want to be successful with, with branded content. I don't know if Andrew well, I just think it's yeah. about, you know, what, what problem is content trying to solve? I mean, it's just very, you know, you've got to listen to your customer, listen to the consumer and understand what they want. And maybe that's maybe not what McDonald's did. They thought they felt actually what we will do is create all this. And the content was actually really good. I mean, production wise, it was it was excellent, but it just didn't have the it didn't. The context wasn't right. Um, you do get the impression with, with both examples, Eleanor, so that they weren't they weren't entirely a stab from the dark. No, like for example, absolutely. Felix, it's like we're a cat company, we know we have a cat as our mascot, people love cats, we'll post something on the internet, obviously it'll be about cat videos then. Or and then with McDonald's you mentioned you know, healthy eating drives and things yeah. like that. Uh, you can link that in some way to what McDonald's did because it's like we've got 72 hours to do some wacky challenge. Let's act now. Let's, you know, and, and, and there's, there's, there's energy to the idea. 
which isn't associated with spending 72 hours sat on your arse eating bones. <laughs> but so, you know, I don't feel like these two ideas were just born out of some guy's head. I agree. And, and there was I no agree. vetting process. But you still, you watch those things and you just think they have just been chucked out there in a throwaway, people will watch anything yeah. type of fashion. Mm. I, I think that, that ultimately, it's very easy when, when you've had the idea and you've lived with it for a, a couple of months and it, you all understand it then on your side but it's just when you put it out to the consumer and you just go don't forgot that actually maybe it wasn't they didn't know the backstory they haven't been with us on the journey they haven't had the opportunity to go through that brainstorm and understand that it's a really good idea they haven't done that we just hit yeah. them or something both of those pieces to me feel like they actually do link with the brand in some way. Yeah. But it's just when I watch it, I just think, well, what's it for? Exactly. No idea. Well, what's so relevant? And I think, you know, that always amazes me, having worked in advertising for so long and looking at how brands invest in research and understanding of, you know, when you're making an ad, you know, you, you do all the testing, you do understand, you don't put anything out there that you don't think is going to work. Why should branded content be any different? Well, it shouldn't be. You need to put that investment in and understanding before you even get to the point where you're putting it out there. It's very, you know, I, I just think people tend to overcomplicate things. And I think it's very easy to do that because we all want to make ourselves, you know, innovation. Everyone wants innovation, that's great, but it's got to be founded in data, evidence and research. And that's where I think we sometimes go wrong. But I think it's a, it's a good point that uh, you know, we need to think strategically and how we can integrate it strategically. So thank you very much uh, for that point. Yes, Jessica. Marvellous. Um, I have a question Thank you. Um, in regards to measuring against an ad. So the examples that you've been using, that's how I would measure it the same way a TV ad in terms of awareness, consideration, and that impact. Um, the Lexus example in terms of it touched, you know, ticking all the boxes in terms of content. Um, did you look at those that only saw, that, that one really fit, fit on the marketing strategy, you can see they were running a campaign around it. Did you look at those that just saw possibly their straight ads, or was just talking to them, versus those that were actually engaged in the content mm. to see that kind of uplift and that impact of branded content versus just running straight ads? Uh, not in this instance, no. But yes, should you understand it in the totality of the marketing yeah. strategy, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and actually, although in the Lexus case, that is the fourth part of a strategic sort of pillar, which has been mainly around content. And the things like the Channel 4 idents and the uh, ads are actually on a separate kind of stream. Although, it, it, with the same overall genre and feeling. So they're coming, they fit together, as in the consumer, you can certainly feel the same energy and things like that, although with slightly less picture of a dashboard and duple. So would you recommend, you know, almost split testing that in terms of that same metric of consideration? Is that where you would say yeah. is the, you know? I think it, it just depends on how much audience you're going to get, right? So with a, a T, well, with a, any campaign that has multi elements, then ideally you would always test the totality of it, which is fine if you're doing TV and outdoor and uh, even maybe a pre-roll, because actually you're intending a large audience to see it. If you then, but then you want to go to the very specialist target that you're going to look at when you add in the content on top of it, because otherwise you get distorted view for that more general population of the whole campaign. So yes, but just make but actually in the analysis I would sort of separate the two yeah. tasks. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, we have here another question. Um, yeah. Well I just wanted to sort of um, elaborate oh, thanks. Um, elaborate on a point really and that's because branding content is still in, in its infancy is that there are a lot of brands that still think it's cheap. And a lot of brands won't invest <coughs> in the in the strategy <coughs> and, and all of the development whereas if it's a massive, you know, TVC campaign or whatever, then the money's there. <coughs> so half the battle from the agency point of view is trying to convince the CFO. Yeah. And I don't know, is there a brighter future? <laughs> I would like to, to say yes, CEO but I'm a little bit I'm a little bit biased. Um, definitely. I think it's beginning to change. I think when you look at the amount of 
campaigns now that have an element of content, it's growing exponentially. I think there's lots of really good examples from around the world now where brands are really investing in it. In, in fact, brands are now investing in it in an area where they are generating revenue from creating content. So brands like PepsiCo, Mondelez, you know, they now have their own studios now where they're actually creating that content to you know, produce revenue. So it's definitely changing. Um, but I think you're right, but you know, the, the academic work we've done is right because the reason we wanted to do this is because you know, un until you understand and define what it is, you can't do it brilliantly. So that's why we've done the academic piece. And obviously Content Monitor is an area where we're showing effectiveness and we're showing actually, we're putting a bit of science behind the art to say this is why you should invest. And that's why we can take this data to the CFO you know, even if you had an av advertising campaign, there's no guarantee that you're going to sell more stuff. But it's kind of putting it into those terms. So, you know, it's definitely there. We've got the research, we've got the, the, the backup to show you and the case studies and come and talk to us. No, I really like to. I think the content monitor is a fantastic idea. Good. And, um, yeah. 2.0 is even better. Yeah. I'd really like to have a chat about that. Thank you. Good. Okay. We have Thank two you. questions at the back. Just give us a sec. Sec. Thank you. Just with regard to the um, quantifying the ROI, can you give a sort of more tangible example of how you would um, do that? Uh, perhaps with something that you've shown, or you know how it would be calculated in theory. So, I, I'm not pretending that I'm going to come, or that we are trying to actually put a dollar value on that or a pound value on that. What we're looking at within the content monitor is very simply the potential to give you that brand uplift. So what it would then need to actually be extrapolated into is um, probably your media uh, owners or, your, or the media buyers uh, platform that can understand how many people have seen it and therefore extrapolate from that. If this many people saw it, and I got this kind of uplift. Yeah. So it's, per it's consideration, isn't yeah. it? It's purchase consideration, then that leads into purchase, I guess. Yeah. So, it's not a, so it's not an ROI as in a monetary value, it is a potential to <coughs> shift. It would be to the CFO that they've seen it. Check yes, I mean, it's, yes. I've, I've played a little bit hard and fast yeah. with our CFO's uh, <laughs> amenability. Uh, just to, one this more. is a, uh, yeah, next question. We have two more questions. Just very briefly, how much experience do you have with uh, evaluating the, the longer term value of, of branded <laughs> content? Uh, if we could predict the longer term value of branded content, we would be very, 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 very rich. Okay. Uh, yeah, because there is currently no real such thing as sort of understanding the lifetime benefit of these things or indeed the benefit of moving brand attributes as opposed to stuff. And this is what we need to invest more why, to, to understand. Why of the analytical tools we try to predict. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we had another uh, question at the back. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, just a quick question on it. So you've shown examples about kind of video content. What about publishing content? Um, so publishers, some of the great work they're doing with, them, with examples of branding content. Um, a great piece is with the New York Times, they did um, for Orange is the New Black, they actually did a whole article on actually women's laws in jails and prisons and literally for that piece of content um, they just branded it for the TV show but it was all about the, the laws and that was actually the highest um, ranked um, news article that day in the New York Times and there's um, the whole piece on the, the Chemco, um, the coffee versus gangs yeah. um, and how that's, uh, you know, that's available on the, in video but then also um, you know, the Telegraph did a great piece with that as well as a partnership. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what's your kind of take on that? On that change? Um, so, in terms of, of measurement, we do work with publishers. We don't use exactly the same thing because obviously they have their own uh, context in which we can test things. So, we tend to essentially use the same methodology, test control, but with their readers or their subscribers normally because that's normally they're trying to prove to ad sales. Uh, that it's worth investing. So, slightly different mechanism, but essentially same design. And are there any different insights coming out yeah. of testing the audiovisual versus the, the uh, visual public publications? It, it tends to be more contextual for the publishers. Where do you put it? 
how do the readers find it? Should they find it through the front page or the, uh, the opening page of the publisher? Or some of the publishers now working with journalists or influencers and doing it the other way around too? I think the general consensus is that you need a bit of both influencer and publisher. Ross, any, any? No, no, no. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, you know, it's it's a bit frustrating uh, for, for the industry and for us to, to say we don't have enough measurements, we don't have enough experience. For an academic, it's very exciting because there are a lot of uh, research we, we have to conduct. But unfortunately, academics are not known uh, to be very quick uh, <clears throat> and not necessarily the most efficient one when it comes to solutions. But we try. We've been uh, collaborating for quite some yeah. time and we sorted out some questions, and I believe looking at media content and looking at the connection and the overlap between media and branded content, there is a huge amount of really exciting questions and hopefully very soon we can provide more data. So thank you very much for this contribution. Yeah. We have a final question uh, over here. Okay. The gentleman in the white shirt. Hi, good evening. Um, a slightly lighter question to end on. Um, good. Does branded content have its own branding issue, should we not just start calling it advertising? Okay. <laughs> because I think from some of the questions that have cropped up, especially around ROI and measurement, come on, are we not just doing kind of slightly clever advertising here on different channels and platforms? To the panel. Yeah. I love the question. Ah, it's a great question. Uh, I will guide you to uh, page 34 right. in our uh, <laughs> academic study, which... <laughs> I think you know it's a it's a very interesting point and and yes you know when we started on this journey three years ago this academic study started and uh, we came up with a I would say quite a broad definition would you agree uh, Bjorn in terms of you know branded content is any content in the eye of the beholder that's associated with a brand that was the, the original definition so from that perspective you could say yes advertising could indeed be branded content so there are elements to it. But I think what content, branded content does, it engages, it doesn't interrupt. So in that way, I would always say that there is, a, there is definitely a difference uh, in terms of what you're doing. The end result may be the same. I want people to feel better about my brand, more purchase intent, buy more stuff. Um, but I think the route to get there is different. But um, yeah. that, that's no, why I, I, I appreciate uh, the question, and that's that's a question that we spent months Absolutely. on. Absolutely, years. And actually, this gentleman <laughs> is responsible <laughs> for giving me and my research assistant a hard time, and we extended the research probably for another six months. Well, absolutely. Because he said, you know, what is what is branded content not? <laughs> we had initially this holistic, or all encompassing yeah. uh, definition that branded content is almost anything, including advertising, because from an academic perspective, when we did our research, that made most sense. Yeah. But then we presented to you lot, to the industry, and you came up very, Im basically immediately, even when we shared it internally within the BCMA, you came up with two criticisms. First of all, it's far too broad. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give me any direction what good branded content looks like. Absolutely. Yeah. And the second thing is it also doesn't tell me how to do it. So we spent a lot of time reanalyzing our data. We interviewed 30 experts, 30 marketing and branded content experts. And what we pulled out is that advertising is about interruption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On TV, for example, while branded content is something that pulls you in, mm -hmm. and we saw some examples, and I was <coughs> a, a little bit disappointed that Eleanor didn't sh didn't show the, the great examples like Like a Girl. Mm -hmm. Most of you might have heard about Like a Girl. Like a Girl received an award from the United Nations yeah. because of the empowerment it has done to women and girls. Yeah, you don't get that that often with advertising, yeah. because you had huge impact. So branded content from a managerial perspective, so from an industry perspective, is about creating content that people choose to engage with. Mm -hmm. And we had some f uh, fantastic uh, quotes where people say, oh, in nine out of 10 cases, you don't really want to engage with advertising. Mm -hmm. Some advertising is really great, like the uh, John Lewis Christmas advertising, for example. But most of the time, you don't want to be interrupted. You want to read your content in the New York Times, or you want to watch uh, your TV uh, series. But branded content is so powerful, and Andrew often uh, uses uh, the Lego movie, for example. 
people are paying money, not only for themselves, but the whole family, and not only money for the cinema ticket, but also the time yeah. to go on a Friday night and watch that, yeah. which is quintessentially branded content. Yeah, and so it's half a billion dollars at the box office for, for a brand that's 70 years old, privately owned, and it makes plastic bricks. You know, the, the bottom line is, what, what I said to Bjorn was, you know, the, the, the academic work is, is a fantastic, and we do need it because there's not enough going on. But what I always see, it has to build a bridge to industry, and we have to be able to use it in practical terms. And I think with this report, that's this exactly what we've done. So yeah. thank you to you and your team. And, and related to two of the comments and questions here, you know, how can we promote a branded content? And it also links back to, you know, does branded content have a branding issue? And I think it does, and even content marketing. And the next step of our research is we figured now out from a managerial perspective what branded content is and how the industry can define it to understand the differences between advertising and branded content and also learn how it works and what the strengths and weaknesses are. But the next step is now to integrate strategically branded content within content marketing, within the discipline of content marketing. And this is what, what we are looking at at, at the next stage. Uh, but this will uh, take, again, a, a lot of time and effort. But we need the collaboration with the industry. So if any of you want to get involved uh, in that research, that uh, would be really much uh, appreciated. And uh, for the time being, thank you very much to the panel. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.